Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Bettis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Andrew Kaufman. He is faculty fellow and lecturer in Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Virginia, where he founded the course Books Behind Bars, Life, Literature, and Leadership. Kaufman is an internationally recognized Tolstoy scholar. His latest book is titled Give War and Peace a Chance, Tolstoyan Wisdom for Troubled Times. He gave a lecture based on his book at the UO on January 13, 2016, as a guest of the Clark Honors College and the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program. Thanks, Andy, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. First, what led to your interest in Russian literature? How did you wind up there? Well, I actually started studying Russian in high school. When I was in 11th grade, I wanted to take some additional courses, and my parents suggested Russian would be a good language because it was 1985. Gorbachev had just come into power, and they thought, and I thought, there might be interesting business opportunities opening up in that part of the world in the next 10 years. But interestingly, even though I started with an interest in more the pragmatic side of Russia when I got to college, I discovered that I loved the literature and the arts even more than the other aspects. So I took a course when I was a sophomore, a, Russian, a survey of Russian literature course, and believe it or not, within the first couple of weeks of the semester, the professor assigned War and Peace. And I think I, I was a sophomore, and it was incredibly scary experience, as it is for most people when they see that book. Um, but what I discovered as I started reading this book and it's something that's never left me. Every time I read it, it's the same experience. It's, it, it was as, as if I was thrown into this world that was incredibly lifelike and real, and these are characters that I knew I had met. I know these people, even though they lived uh, you know, 200 years ago. Um, and so I was blown away by the, the lifelikeness of, the, of, the, of Tolstoy's prose, but also the philosophical depth, the way in which certain characters are asking the big questions. There are, most characters are not. They're the socialites who are just going through life and, and playing the roles as, as they think they're supposed to play their roles in life. But the characters that really started to grab my attention were the ones who were really on that, that quest because as a young man, having just been thrown into a new environment myself, moving from the Midwest to the East, I was one of those people I was really trying to find my place in the world and so it really began to resonate with that aspect of Tolstoy um, and that kind of questing spirit is so fundamental to so many of the characters in Russian literature and I, so I think I was just destined to go in that direction. So you've just given a, um, an explanation for why you went there, why uh, Russian lit and why Tolstoy became important to you. So War and Peace is this 1,500-page book. There's 600 characters. It describes events in Russia 200 years ago, originally written in Russian. So why should today's readers in the English-speaking world give War and Peace a chance? You told us why you gave it a chance. Mm -hmm. Why should other people do that? Um, well, for a lot of reasons. For, for starters, the, the one of the things that makes Tolstoy such a genius as an artist is he captures what's universal about these specific experiences. So even though he's describing very specifically characters in a particular time and place, what you discover very quickly is that any human being can relate to the issues that they're grappling with. Every single human being knows what it means to deal with a difficult family situation. Every person understands what it means to search for your place in society. Everyone contends with death. Everyone has relationship issues. Everyone in their own way is searching for, you know, how we're going to spend our very limited amount of time on this earth. And at some level, that is the, those are the questions that every character in War and Peace, each in his or her own way, grapples with. And so in that sense, it is utterly relevant. It's, it's an incredibly universal book. And I'll say one more thing, even more specifically, War and Peace in particular is uniquely relevant to the age that we live in right now because it is a book, it's a book about many things, but at one level it, it is ultimately a book about society going through a time of crisis. It, it's a serious crisis, it's the wars with Napoleon. Um, Napoleon eventually invades Russia. Tolstoy describes this period in Russian history 
the changing of the guards, when people's values are being tested, when um, an entire society is being turned upside down and people are f trying to figure out, okay, what do we believe? Where are we headed as, as, a, as a people? How do we live in these kinds of troubled transitional times? And I would argue that, that is a mirror of you know, the beginning of the 21st century that we live in today. So your most recent book, Give War and Peace a Chance, Tolstoy and Wisdom for Troubled Times. Mm -hmm. And you've just begun to make this argument. Tell us, um, so obviously part of the reason you wrote this book is to make this argument that there's wisdom in this book for us, for our times. What else led you to write, re, um, write this book? Why, why did you think this was a book that needed to be written? So the other main, so the primary purpose, as you've said, is really to offer a guide to readers to the wisdom that Tolstoy offers that, that is relevant to every one of us. But at another level, I simply wanted to write a book that would take this massive, intimidating classic of world literature that people are terrified of. I can't tell you how many people I've been told who've told me that you know they're either afraid to even start it or they've tried to read this thing and they quit after the first 50 pages because of all those Russian characters' names. So, in a sense, I wrote this book for all of those people mm -hmm. um, to make their experience of reading this book much more accessible, much more enjoyable. So in addition to the discussions of the life wisdom that Tolstoy offers, I also provide a lot of context, historical context, social context. I interweave many stories from Tolstoy's own life. So you're actually, it's also in a way, a kind of biography of Tolstoy. Because each one of the themes that I write about was vitally relevant to him. And so you're learning about his biography and why these issues that I'm writing about were important to him. Um, and so, uh, and the other thing that I do in the book that a lot of readers have enjoyed is that as you're moving through my book, you're actually moving through the plot of War and Peace. And that was very intentional. It's extremely difficult to do structurally, but it was important. And the reason it was important is because there's a subset of readers of my book who may not want to read War and Peace in the very near future. And that's not my goal. I hope they do. But even if they don't, once they've finished my book, they have plenty, they know plenty about the novel, the context, they know everything they need to know for the cocktail, cocktail party. party. And, um, and, uh, and they may want to wait six months before they actually take on the novel, but th it will have been a full experience. I know you've <coughs> called it um, uh, Cliff Notes on uh, steroids. But there's another aspect to your book that you haven't really spoken about, which I think is w one of the most interesting aspects, which is it's also a story about you. Yeah. And about your the way this book has taught you wisdom when you, in your troubled times. You want to say a little bit about why that was an important part of the project? So the way I came into the book is, and the very concept of the book grew out of a period in my life in 2000, uh, 2008. And you remember that was the time when the newspapers were writing about the financial crisis, well, I and my family experienced that financial crisis. And I'm not going to share on television the details. People can read the book if they want some of those details. But it was a, a moment in my life when I experienced a serious rupture. And some of my most basic assumptions about the world, about myself, about my place in it, were shattered. And I realized very personally in those days that my happiness and my security are gifts that can be shattered like that in an instant. And it was a really powerful lesson. Many people, I think, learned that lesson at that time. Many people have learned that lesson in, in other ways. And so that gave me a whole new insight into, into War and Peace. And it made me real. I saw something in the book I hadn't noticed before, that this is, as I said, ultimately a book about a society of people going through a time of crisis. And so the impetus behind the book was very personal. And in fact, the first, one of the first chapters I wrote was the chapter called Rupture, in which I talk about that event in my life. And so given the personal impetus behind the book, it would simply be dishonest and impossible to write a book about Tolstoy's wisdom without also sharing how his wisdom has personally affected me and how I've learned from his book. Can you give me an example of a moment in the novel 
uh, that was a resonant moment for you at that time, that where, that what, where you felt this lesson coming through the novel that spoke to you in your moment of rupture? Well, so that's um, an example that I write about in the rupture chapter. And it was actually this scene that I began with. I would say, I would say this is the scene that Give War and Peace a Chance began with. It's a moment very early in the novel when a young man, um, a character, a hero of the novel by the name of Nikolai Rostov, um, has just lost 43,000 rubles at the gambling table. He's a young man who had a gambling addiction. And that's not the exact scenario that I went through. I didn't have a gambling addiction. But still, what happened was he lost this money. And, and he was so utterly ashamed at what he had done that he comes home and he literally wants to put a bullet through his own head. Because in that moment, it felt to him as if the bottom had fall out, f fallen out, as if his world had crashed. But very interestingly, in that moment of rupture, he happens to listen to his sister Natasha sing. And he's so transported by the beauty and the power of her voice that he actually is impelled to join in with her and he doesn't want the day to end. So literally two hours before, the weight of the world was on his shoulders and, in the, and all of a sudden he is on top of the world. And how does this happen? Well, it happens because he had listened to his sister hundreds of times before but only in that moment, on the heels of his own personal crisis, was he actually able to hear her in a completely new way and appreciate the power and the beauty of her voice. And in many ways, that's what happened to my, with my relationship with Tolstoy. And that scene I understood in an entirely new way after having gone through my personal crisis. And even specifically, I write about in the book, it was a couple days after I'd gotten the news and I happened to be completely depressed. I was sitting there on the couch. I was in my messy home in Charlottesville and, and, um, and basically I was depressed. I hadn't gone so far as I wanted to put a bullet through my head, but I was depressed and I just, for the heck of it, put on some clarinet concertos by Carl Maria von Weber, whom I hadn't listened to in 20 years. And all of a sudden in that moment, something happened where this music just carried me away and transported me to this completely new place and it was this as if I was able to hear the beauty of that music for the very first time and I'm sure that I was able to do that because I was in a, in a ruptured state. I was able to, to hear and appreciate things that simply went unnoticed before. For me that story is about the transformative and redemptive power of art both within the narrative of War and Peace, but also within your narrative. You are the founder of uh, the Books Behind Bars program. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that this is a program that's based on the foundational assumption that literature has this transformative, redemptive power. Tell us about the Books Behind Bars program. What is it? How does it work? So you're absolutely right in, in your assumption that, in a sense, give War and Peace a chance and the Books Behind Bars program are of a piece. They both came from the same impulse, which is my realization of the power of literature to change lives. And so, um, so that connection is, uh, is very strong. Um, and we can talk more about that. But the Books Behind Bars program itself is a program that I started in 2009. And it was after I had done a workshop in a prison. I had been invited to discuss a work by Tolstoy called The Death of Ivan Ilyich um, in a Prison. It's a powerful book about a guy who contracts a fatal illness and realizes, you know, what have I done with my life? Have I lived my life correctly? And so I got the opportunity to discuss that book with a group of adult inmates in a prison. I'd never been to a prison before. And it was the most powerful classroom experience of my life because um, there was something incredibly authentic and real about that conversation in a way that I hadn't experienced before. And something else happened from that conversation. I came away from that day's interaction with a new understanding of this story. And so I st began to think, wow, if, if that kind of a situation could have had an, such an impact on me as a teacher, someone who thought I knew this story, what if I were to create a course in which I put my own undergraduate students in a similar environment where they sit down 
side by side with people who come from a very different world, and in the case of Books Behind Bars, it's youth prisoners, youth inmates, and have them have conversations with these young men who come from very different worlds, what might happen with them. And so that was the impulse behind Books Behind Bars. And, 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 it's, and what students do is they go in, it's, it's part of a course at UVA. Students at UVA take the course for credit. The young um, residents at the Correctional Center volunteer for it. And once a week, for an hour and a half, my students go to a juvenile correctional center, and they all work in pairs, and they sit down at a table. Each pair of UVA students sits down at a table with two to four incarcerated youth, and they lead a discussion. Um, they're not teaching. They're, they don't look at themselves as teachers. They're facilitators. Their job is to lead an interesting, engaging, very personal discussion about that week's reading, which both they and the, and the inmates had read. Um, and the students do that for an hour and a half for 10 weeks. And, um, and that's the core of the program. And it's been going on for seven, se we're in our seventh year now. What have you learned the program gives to or does for the residents? What did they tell you they take from it? What is it, f what is it like for them? So fortunately, um, we have a research project which is being conducted. I'm actually the principal investigator. I've also done a crash course in social science. I'm not a social scientist, but I know enough to be dangerous um, and enough to be the PI of a research project which has several uh, education researchers involved through our Curry School of Education. And this research project has allowed us to fairly systematically answer that question and track the impact that this program is having. And some of the findings which I'm going to still call tentative because we haven't um, published a lot about this, but some of the findings are, some of the most powerful findings are that the, a number of the residents who go through this program realize that they can do college level work. And this is the first time in their lives that they've been told that or shown that, that here they are sitting down side by side with UVA students, college students, having college level conversations about college level techs and this is an incredibly empowering experience for them. So a number of the residents after having gone through this experience have applied to and actually have since enrolled in college and that includes some who never even thought college was in their futures. So that's one of the findings which is incredibly powerful. Another discovery is that the experience of having disciplined conversation about often difficult issues has given these young men a kind of impulse control. Mm -hmm. We've found, and they've even reported, that it makes them think twice before they act on an impulse. They learn a kind of reflective habit of mind. They think about themselves and their own behavior in a way that maybe they hadn't before. And so it's having an impact in that regard. Another finding which is um, utterly surprising, and I was blown away when I heard this. A number of the residents that we interview have said that watching the UVA students come into their facility and do this kind of work with them has actually inspired them, the residents, to want to give back to their own communities mm. when they get out. And if you think about that, these are young men who are in prison and would have every justifiable right to not care about their communities. But actually, just the opposite has happened as a result of this experience. So they want to get involved in whatever their area of interest is. Um, and then finally, the final area of impact is that it's given them, they've discovered that since they are able to stretch academically and do something as difficult and as foreign as Russian literature, mm -hmm. it has empowered them to th think, well, what other areas of interest might I have that I haven't taken the risk of exploring? academic interest, non-academic interest. So it's actually um, inspired them to take on more risks and try out more things in their lives just as they took on this program as a, as a, you know, as a risk. What do your findings tell you the program does for the outside students, for the UVA students? The, the subtitle of the course is Life, Literature, and Leadership. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do they tell you about what they've learned? About life, literature, and leadership. So I would say first and foremost, one of the biggest areas of impact for the UVA students is that they discover or in some cases rediscover the incredible relevance of literature. 
That may sound obvious, but it's not because I've had students who have taken literature classes who were maybe burnt out by literature from high school or who loved it in high school and got to college and had a different experience. And not, not all students fall into this category, but there's a, a, a large group of students who have said that literature means something again to me and that literature is a vehicle for something much bigger than the words on the page. It's a vehicle for community building. It's a vehicle for a much deeper kind of personal reflection than I ever thought was possible in a literature class. And so that, for me, as a humanist, is a really powerful finding. And we hear that in various, in various forms and contexts. Another area of impact is that the UVA students have discovered a new career path for themselves. Or an old career path that they had been thinking about has been reinforced. Many of them realized after this experience that, wow, I want a career that has a service component. I need to be doing something that matters in the world. And so I've had some students, and, and I personally think everything matters, and each person has to figure out for him, him or herself you know, what they need to do that matters. But I've had some students who have decided they want to apply to go to law school, not as they had once thought to become necessarily a partner in a corporate law firm, which I don't have any intrinsic problem with, but they've decided that they want to be an advocate for incarcerated youth. I've had some students who've gone, in and w gone on to work in the system of incarceration, in corrections in various capacities, and they never would have considered that um, before having taken um, this course. And then finally, sort of related to the f first comment that I made about the humanities, is students have gone through a lot of personal growth through this experience. Because the nature of the conversations in this class are very personal, very reflective, and students are asked and they're required to go to places intellectually, emotionally, spiritually that they're not often asked to go in other classes. And so it has really forced them to do some hard personal contemplation about what they value, um, what's important to them. And, um, you know, and that is, as a humanist, you know, ultimately the, those kinds of conversations about the things that matter in life is ultimately what I think is most important about a humanities education. And students are learning that firsthand. Can I ask you to elaborate a little bit more on that in a more specific context? So you're, you're a humanities professor, I'm a humanities professor. We live in a time when we are being told repeatedly on the front page of the New York Times, in administrative faculty contexts, that the humanities doesn't matter. That is to say, it's not going to get you a job. It's not. Go it doesn't do the work that needs to be done for the 21st century. You've been talking about this. Everything you've said has been about this question. Can you? Um, give me your strongest argument for why the humanities matter based on everything that you've done, everything that you've talked about. Why do the humanities matter? I want everyone to have an answer to that question that, that's persuasive. You seem like someone who makes this argument persuasively. So I make the argument in two ways. There's a way to, to, to make the argument generally, but I also find it's very useful to get very specific and look at some specific examples of conversations that happen and the kind of learning that takes place. And let me just give one specific example from conversations that have happened in books behind bars. We read Crime and Punishment. Um, we actually typically don't read longer works, but one summer there was a group of UVA students and incarcerated students who wanted to read a longer novel. So we spent the summer reading Crime and Punishment. And there was a moment later on in the novel where the protagonist, the young um, protagonist Raskolnikov, who has committed a double murder, confesses his crime. And the person he's chosen to confess his crime to is a young prostitute whom he has befriended by the name of Sonia. And he tells Sonia about this horrendous double murder that he's committed. One of the people that he's murdered is actually one of Sonia's friends. And he tells her this. And the way she reacts is rather than running away, slapping him. She does something completely unexpected. She embraces him, and she weeps. 
And he looks at her and he said, how can you respond to what I've just told you in that way? And she says, because I can see that you are one of the unhappiest people in the world. Well, when we were discussing that scene, one of the young inmates said to the group, he said, where is my Sonia? Where is the person in my life who will see the worst of what I've done and still love me and respect me as a human being? And in that moment, you could hear a pin drop in the room because every single person in that room, the free and the incarcerated, was thinking about, that's a good question. Where is my Sonia? Where is that person who will respect me and love me for all of my imperfections? And they were thinking, and we talked about, to whom am I a Sonia? Is there a person in my life that I am capable of expressing that kind of humanity towards? I didn't have to give a lecture about the theme of compassion and Dostoevsky. That theme was being played out and enacted before our very eyes. I don't think that kind of conversation and the transformative impacts that come, that come out of that kind of conversation can happen in many different disciplines, except in a discipline when you are dis discussing people in very complex situations at the deepest emotional level. That is a wonderful response to my question. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you so much for telling us about your scholarly work and your work in the prisons. It's been a delight. Thank you, great being here. I've been speaking with Andrew Kaufman, faculty fellow mm -hmm. and lecturer in Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Virginia. He gave a lecture titled Give War and Peace a Chance, Tolstoyan Wisdom for Troubled Times at the UO on January 13th, 2016 as a guest of the Clark Honors College and the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program. Thanks so much for watching. Mm -hmm.